Good morning, dear saints, and blessed Easter. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today is Tuesday, April 23rd, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the Holy Scriptures to which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church here in Laverne, Minnesota. This morning, we're opening up Proverbs chapter 11, the first half, verses 1 through 15. Now, these Proverbs explore the themes of integrity and generosity, also community spirit, of course, through those vivid contrasts of righteous and wicked behavior. The passage begins with a strong condemnation of things like dishonest scales, but they symbolize the broader disdain for all forms of deceit and corruption. It praises the virtues of humility and righteousness, promising prosperity and deliverance as their rewards, while foretelling ruin for the proud and the deceitful. Friends, I'm so glad that you've joined us today, whether it's over the air on AM 850 in St. Louis or through your favorite podcasting service, maybe through that KFUO mobile app or through KFUO.org. I'm just glad you're here. So settle in, open your hearts and your minds. We are about to begin. Thy Strong Word is graciously supported in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. When you get time, learn more about what they do for the kingdom at LHF Missions. That's missions with a plus S on the end, dot org to learn more. And if you have any questions about today's show or comments, concerns, complaints, it doesn't matter to me as long as it's about Proverbs 11, you can email me at pastorboo at gmail.com. You can find me on Facebook, send me a text message. I got that window open, looking at it right now. Or you can call in 1-800-730-2727. Well, joining us this morning is the Reverend Jacob Herkamp. He's the pastor of Christ Lutheran Church in Noblesville, Indiana, or is it Illinois? Good morning, Pastor Herkamp. Welcome back to the program. Uh, Blessings to be with you. I'm sorry that my voice is kind of froggy today. I've been fighting some allergies the last couple of days. And I think today the, the Lord is uh, blessing me with a uh, raspy voice. And it uh, is all right. Indiana, so glad and it is Indiana. You. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, well, no problem. We'll bear with the voice, I'm sure. You know, when I was a kid at the, uh, at the mostly Baptist churches, every Wednesday it seemed that they would have a singing, right? Not really a service, but just Wednesday night church, and you would just come and sing. And sometimes they would have special singings. They'd have people from the congregation come up and sing, or they might even get like a local uh, gospel quartet to come and sing. And I just always really enjoyed that. Well, what I always, you're saying, um, don't mind the voice, always, always reminds me of so often they would get up and they would say, now listen, I can't sing really well, so just don't mind our voices, but just listen to the words. You know, and I always thought that was funny because I was there to listen to them sing. If they can't sing, they shouldn't be singing. But in your case, <laughs> I will tell the people, just listen to the words that he uses. That's where the wisdom is, even if his voice is a little a little raggedy. Well, well Go God, doesn't, uh, God, God doesn't say to uh, make a perfect pitch noise. He says make a joyful noise. That's right. So make a I joyful like noise. Absolutely. So, I've known plenty of people. A, it's who, a joy to be with you. Yeah, I know plenty of people who couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, but boy, they love making joyful noises to the Lord, and that's what it's about. I tell you what, why don't you uh, open us with a word of prayer? Let us pray. Merciful Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity to be diving into Proverbs 11 this day. May you open our hearts and our minds, as well as our ears, as we hear your wisdom proclaimed through uh, Solomon this day. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, we've just finished chapter 10 yesterday, and now the chapter 11, we've talked about how the versification, including the chapters and verses of the book of the Bible, they came much, much later. And it's sometimes difficult to figure out, well, when should the next chapter begin or when should even the next verse begin? And, and it's pretty well settled at this point. No one's asking our opinion, but sometimes we run into places where it just seems like the thought kept going, but they divided it. In this case, it seems kind of apparent why we have the division. The conversation shifts now to, well, things of like we could really relate to, like money, uh, trade, uh, <laughs> honesty. Um, these proverbs take that security, which is enjoyed by the righteous, and, and contrast it with the inevitable destruction of the wicked. 
Um, but it talks about things that, that really kind of make sense to us even today. And so that's what we're going to go through. Any other groundwork you want to lay before we just dive into the verses? Yeah, I wanted to um, make a make a quick observation. I'm sure you've talked about this before, but um, because of something that I'm working on in my classwork um, as a PhD student, um, I'm blessed to be uh, working in the book of Deuteronomy. And I have a presentation on Deuteronomy 17, uh, 14 through 20, and uh, the law of the king. And interestingly, there, there is a command about the king to write down a copy of this law. And what is interesting to me is, is that we have two books, or at least a couple of, we have two kings that we know um, wrote um, books in our scriptures. So we have Proverbs written by Solomon, and we have the Psalms written by David. And why will put my bottom dollar on the fact that um, Proverbs was written as a discourse on the law uh, that we have um, given by Moses. And what we see, I believe, here will be start looking at the Ten Commandments and seeing how we can play with um, each of the Ten Commandments in light of what we're reading in Proverbs. And I think Solomon masterfully shows um, wisdom and um, expands the, the laws that we have, say, in the Ten Commandments and puts them into uh, particular uh, spheres of our lives. Agreed. And, and as we read these, we're going to find that there's both very just sort of almost common sense practical wisdom, but then also deeper spiritual meanings oftentimes too, both of which are valid, both of which are useful. And, and yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you. I mean, this is, this is the impact of, of what God had instructed the kings to pass down. Um, let's, let's start with verse 11, chapter 11, pardon me, verse 1. And here we go. Let me pull up my Bible. Just closed it. Sorry, folks. Here we go. A false balance is an abomination to Yahweh, but a just weight is his delight. All right. That's the first of these Proverbs. And most of them are just one sort of one verse Proverbs. So a false balance is an abomination to Yahweh, but a just weight is his delight. You know, it. It kind of makes sense. The, the Hebrew here is a stone of deceit, but obviously from context and from historical tradition, we know what's going on here. This is about buying and selling and, and being honest about it. Take us through it. Yeah, so um, obviously we can go back into the various stories, the various narratives of the Old Testament to, to realize um, where this wisdom comes from as well. Um the, the false balance discussions, God wants his people um, to be fair um, with one another, obviously, and in, even in the in light of um, working with um, their neighbors, right? If we, if the people of Israel are called to be a light to the nations um, as the royal priesthood, um, according to Exodus chapter 20 in light of the giving of the Ten Commandments and being um, God's chosen instrument um, in order to proclaim his excellencies uh, to the nations and his wisdom, they need to convey um, this, this justice, um, if you will, and to be fair when it comes to how um, trade is done, not to deceive people, but to um, work in a fair and equitable way, um, just as the Lord shows his, his kindness to, to his people um, in being just um, with, with, them, with his grace. Here we are um, doing just things in our daily lives and transactions as well. And, and I'm sure most people know, but just in case people might not be familiar with it out there, the, the balance in practice was basically uh, you, you can think of uh, the image of Lady Justice holding those scales. You know, it, it's in such a way where if you put a, a known amount of weight on one side, you can then put other items on the other side. And then when they balance out, then their weight is equal. And so in a time before money was really used very much, I mean, money came around the 7th century B.C., 
But still, even money was often weighed, too, because it was the precious metals that had value, gold, silver, that sort of thing. So you would have rocks or stones or even pieces of little metal that you knew or at least claimed to know the weight of. And so if you were dishonest, you would say that the uh, you would say that your heavier weights were lighter. So they would have to put more gold on it to balance out. And, and, and so, yeah, obviously, that makes sense. You want people to be fair in their trade. I, I think of when you go to the gas station and you see those little stickers and they are certified to be giving you what the merchant claims. There's there's a motive on behalf of the merchant to cheat you and if they want to get you know gains falsely. There's also a motive on behalf of the merchant to treat you fairly so that you'll continue to return and trust them. So this idea of, of a false balance being an abomination to the Lord makes sense on the ground, makes sense for society. People can't go around cheating each other. But I also think about just the justice that God requires for our sins. So many popular depictions of the end of our lives, and I think they're, they're fairly false in their depiction, but still, so many popular depictions as you get to the end, and God, an angel, St. Peter or somebody puts, uh, you know, puts all of your works and all your life on a scale and you, you either tip over into, well, I get to go to heaven or you, you aren't balanced and you end up going to hell or something to that effect. But that's not how God works. But so many people look at their lives like that because God could call for a just accounting and we need to appreciate just how um, <laughs> basically how much God had to put his finger on the scale on our side of it to save us from our sins. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, totally. And, and we can continue to um, look at how, um, what is, like you said, what is needed for, um, for the Lord's um, justice to be quelled, right? Um, God's, when we talk about God's justice, we're also talking about his wrath for sin. Um, and, in in the fact that we can look at this in, in light of Christ and see how how you're you're correct the the blood of God had to be on the that's what outweighs our sin that's the only thing that outweighs our sin um, and thus is the only way and manner in which um, justice is is meted out properly and um, the only way that we we have any standing before God. I think I might have lost you. Anyway, oh, I'm we really have sorry about that. Are That's you okay. there? Yes, sorry yes. That. So anyway, we have standing before God. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we have standing before God because of um, the blood of, of God himself, Christ, um, being in the balance. And and that, yes, because, you know, if you put your – and I didn't fully explain it. Like if you put your good works on one side and your sins on the other, the idea is whichever one weighs heavier is going to just choose your fate. And and I think God could very well do that. But as you said, the blood of Jesus is essentially infinitely poured on our side of the balance. Our good works then overflow. Uh, we are saved, of course, by Christ's sacrifice, not by our good works. Not that we shouldn't do them. Uh, and in fact, you talked about – Knowing where you stand, the next pro proverb speaks to that. Verse, uh, verse 2 in Proverb 2 in chapter 11, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. So this idea that of arrogance, pride, right? Uh, in the next chapter, it's going to say the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Uh, 21, it's going to say, scoffer is the name of the arrogant, haughty man who acts with arrogance and pride. Brother, have you ever known anybody who, because of their great experience or learning or training or both, just were, were just full of knowledge, yet their pride kind of got in the way of you respecting them? I, I know lots of people like that, I'm afraid. Funny enough, um, so today, as we are um, live, I'm planning on going up to uh, Fort Wayne to uh, witness the uh, Vicarage placement service tonight. And uh, mm -hmm. this, this, uh, this verse in particular um, reminds me of my own Vicarage um, because I was a student who was blessed to go over to Westfield House, Cambridge, England. And um, I came back um, with all that academic knowledge and, uh, certainly learned my place. 
um, during vicarage. Um, and uh, was, was, I wasn't confronted with this verse, but I certainly right. was reminded um, there is something, there's a difference between being educated and being wise. Um, and um, the, the difference really is, is being a, wisdom is something that can be um, given to someone else. So your education is not just your own, but it's something that you are able to pass along um, to someone else, all of what you have learned and the like. And um, it took me took me half my vicarage to figure that out. <laughs> uh, but it was it was it was a very, very good learning experience. And certainly um, this verse reminds me of that. And as a father, um, it uh, certainly uh, m- makes me. Um, want to bring um, bring that education and learning um, down to my children. And then as a pastor now, it certainly um, continues to beckon me to make sure that what I'm saying is actually being understood in a way that uh, does not come across as arrogant, but certainly... Um, is something that can be picked up on by by the congregation members and uh, and held on to uh, that points them further to Christ and strengthens their faith. Yeah, I mean, you know, and that's the thing too. Our our parishioners, uh, listen, pastors in the LCMS are incredibly well formed for ministry. Um, certainly appreciate those pastors because I've interacted with pastors of other traditions um, and. And frankly, we just have, and I'm being a little biased, I suppose, but we just have an excellent pastoral formation system in our residential schools and other processes. Uh, and so your pastor is very knowledgeable, um, but yeah, it takes time to learn how to put that knowledge into practice. And, and and that's what Proverbs has been saying, right? There's wisdom and then there's insight and understanding and how to apply that wisdom is, is sometimes different. Uh, I sometimes say, or I have said before in jest, that I wish I was a second semester, or I'm sorry, a second year seminarian again, because gosh, when I was second year of seminary towards the end, I knew everything. I just wish I knew all that I knew when I was so hey, confidently right. arrogant as I went into my courage. I completely understand. It was yeah. quite the it was quite the learning curve um, being tossed out as a vicar in Southwest Nebraska. Um, and, um, being now almost, um, seven years out of seminary, um, there's certainly things to, it's like, yep, I could definitely, uh, re, uh, I have plenty of things for past Jacob to learn. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And 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 this is, this is why, you know, Luther talks about those three ways that form a theologian. And this is why experience is also extremely important, not just education. Uh, but yeah, so when pride comes, then comes disgrace. So this is a warning, not just against perhaps church leaders, but all Christians. You know, we can actually become very prideful as a result of the wisdom and gifts that God gives us all. I mean, think about you look out into the world and sometimes you'll see unbelievers and they'll be living in a certain way or they'll be mourning a certain way because they don't have the same hope or they'll be struggling with things that perhaps the believer has a little bit more moral guidance on and and you feel bad for them. But at the same time, you could also become a little prideful like, you know, aren't I glad that I'm not like other sinners, you know, and and that's where the disgrace comes in to be humble is to say. When we look out in the world and we see fellow sinners struggling with their sin to say, you know, how can I reach them with the good news? Not, oh, I thank God that I'm not them. And, and that, so it, it can come for all of us, this idea of pride. Oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And the most humble, humble manner in which we um, can come before God is literally with the Kyrie eleison, have mercy upon me. I confess what you say about me and i say it's true so have mercy on me that's the wisest place that we can be to put ourselves in that position of you are you are creator i am creature and be merciful to be able to same say with the apostles you know uh, 
Yes, we believe. Help our help unbelief. Our unbelief. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. And, and that just so uh, apropos for us as humans. Like, of course we believe. Of course we do. And yet we act in ways as if we didn't believe. And 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 so we need. We can constantly need that help. And speaking of walking in ways, uh, verse three: the integrity of the upright guides them, the wise, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. So we have integrity of the upright guides them. But in this case, if I'm reading it correctly, it looks like the righteous, the upright, are actually destroyed by the crookedness of the treacherous. Am I reading that right? Uh, that's a good question. I, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I, uh, um, but that is I mean, or, or, or is it the treacherous is destroying the treacherous? The, tre- yes, the crookedness I think, is destroying I, I the think, treacherous. Yeah, I think that would be the better reading. Yeah, but okay. both, this is the thing though, right? We 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 can look at this and say it yes, the answer is yes, because I mean, why did God tell the people of Israel, do not intermarry with all of the peoples around you? They are going to lead you into, into idolatry. Their their crookedness will overtake you. Nah. Um and and the like. And so you can have that, but we also understand those people who are crooked and treacherous that will also destroy them. And so the, the way, the way that I would encourage our listeners to read this proverb is to say the only way that one is kept in integrity is by um, remaining steadfast in the word of God, which is, Again, going back to verse two, remaining humble before him, Mm -hmm. asking for his um, light to guide them on the path to righteousness. Um, That way, the the crooked way of the treacherous does not overtake them. Right. And so um, and then bouncing back into the book of Proverbs, there's a reason why um, Lady Folly sounds or speaks like lady wisdom right the only way that we know one from the other is by being guided by the word itself right Mm -hmm. we have to know the word um and we need to know the voice of our lord to um figure out which which way is is his if that makes any sense no, it absolutely does. I mean, they're both out there vying for the same attention. We we haven't discussed the idea that they sound very similar, but that's an interesting detail because, you know, the messages are delivered pretty much in the same way. You know, one is luring you down with uh, with all these attractive things. The other is at every corner proclaiming the truth. I, yeah, I think it's it's always it's always difficult for us humans with our fallen human natures to be able to discern God's will. But it's especially hard if we are simply not in the word. I mean, how many well, people and, say, well, I want to I want to live for Christ. I want to do what Christ would want. I want to be able to be protected in times of, of 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 trouble. And yet they're not in the word where God easily gifts them with those things. Well, and I, yeah, you're probably. Yeah, I was going to say and add just saying, remember that Satan imitates. Right. There's a reason why Peter calls Satan a roaring lion. It's because Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Um, so Lady Folly tries to imitate Lady Wisdom uh, with smooth talk and the like. Um, the crookedness of the treacherous doesn't, I mean, this is why Jesus also speaks of, you know, the, the way is narrow or the way is wide, right? Because the way um, is, both ways look kind of similar right um to the naked eye but only those who know the good shepherd's voice ultimately knows who's knows where he's going to guide right and that's where the integrity of the upright comes from it doesn't come from themselves per se but it comes from knowing the word that guides them and carries them along i think that it makes a lot of sense especially in light of what follows because we have the integrity of the upright is what's guiding them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them, them being the treacherous. So their own crookedness destroys them. Of course, it would destroy anyone who's upright that falls into that crooked way too. 
And then verse 4 says, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Uh, this idea of riches, riches don't profit in the day of wrath is certainly one that we're all familiar with as we reflect on our own mortality. And yet, when we're in our normal lives, we will do almost anything to increase our riches. And yet, they don't do anything for you when the day of the Lord comes. At least that's how I read it. I understand that it could be read in the day of the wrath of God or the day of the fury or wrath of man. I think it's the wrath of God because in that day, that's when the righteous will be delivered from death. Um, But either way, we see here how following God's will, as the Proverbs are telling us to, isn't just about temporal long life and, and, and reward, but rather eternal life. It will literally be delivered from death from this. Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, you can't take these things with you. Jesus makes it perfectly clear. Do not chase after those things which rust and moth destroy, right? Um, but ultimately, go after those things which makes one's which makes one righteous which is himself right um and what does he do he makes himself um yours he he actually is the one who finds you he's the one who chases after you um and so and thus gives you his righteousness and gives you so much more for um for the for the life everlasting um, you're not going to miss out on on riches and the like in the world to come uh, because of what Christ has done in giving you his righteousness, which ultimately is what delivers from death because it's only his righteousness um, that ultimately matters um, in that day because every person, um, regardless whether good or bad, they are all called uh, by by the servants of the Lord to know him um, as he desires himself to be known um, so that we may be brought into integrity and um, bear his righteousness. That we may be brought into integrity and bear his righteousness is what you said. And that's really important. Back in chapter three, verse six, it says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. In verse five of our text for today, the righteousness of the blameless keeps his way straight, but the wicked falls by his own wickedness. So not reading it in the context of the scriptures, you might start to get this idea that, well, to be able to be redeemed from death, all I have to do is stay on the straight and narrow. And that's true, practically speaking, but the broader point of scripture is that that righteousness is something that we've not been able to achieve and yet it's still a gift to us. Yeah, I mean, the, the law is given with that little promise, right? If you do these things, you shall live. But the problem is, is that you can't because of sin. So you cannot call yourself blameless before God. That doesn't work. You are still in a very, very tough dilemma uh, before the Lord because of sin. And the only, again, the only one who is truly blameless is he who was sent by the Father into the world. Um, and interestingly enough, interestingly enough, the um, you think about what what was the call of of John the Baptist to do to make his way straight, right? Right. So. Um, the righteousness of the blameless is ultimately um, the the is is Christ Himself, um, and the preaching of the Baptist gets people into um, Christ's way or onto Christ's way, mm-hmm. if you if you will, right, um, and prepares them for for this straight way. Um, if that makes, if, if it does, John, John prepares the way Christ walks it in our place. And then we get to follow behind him in uprightness and integrity. 
uh, but of course, aided by the Holy Spirit. I tell you what, folks, this looks like a good time to take a pause. We're at the bottom of the hour, but don't go anywhere. We're going to let our, our our guest, Pastor Herkamp, rest his voice, but he's going to come back right after these messages. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today, it's the Reverend Jacob Herkamp, pastor of Christ Lutheran Church in Noblesville, Indiana. And don't forget that you can reach out to me at pastorboo at gmail.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R-B-O-O-E at gmail.com. Or you can find me on Facebook. Just search for Phil Boo. You can also call in 1-800-730-2727. Call in with your comments or questions. Well, we are going to head right back to our text, though, and so um, hopefully you had at least 120 seconds to rest your voice a little bit. I appreciate you being such a trooper. Uh, Hey, it's fine. It's great. Verse 6 kind of ties in with verse 5, not kind of. It actually is uh, a parallel to it. The righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the treacherous are taken captive by their lust. So uh, that whole kind of in order is, the righteous of the blameless keeps his way straight, but the wicked falls by his own wickedness. The righteous of the upright delivers them, but the treacherous are taken captive by their lust. Um, the the righteous are, are sorry, well, the upright, I should say, are being delivered by the righteousness, which is a gift, but the treacherous are taken captive by their lust. One thing I like to say, and sometimes people push back a little bit, and that's okay, but I don't think that. Satan himself cannot tempt you to do anything that you don't already want to do. I, I, I believe our concupiscence, our depravity is so bad that we don't really need Satan's help in being completely unrighteous. Um, so, you know, whether the devil makes you do it or you're tempted by Satan as our Lord was, or it's just your own concupiscence, I think we struggle with the fact that our fallen, de- uh, rebellious human natures are constantly wanting and lusting after things that are not good for us. Uh, totally. I, I mean, when I, when I look at this, I'm, I'm thinking through um, the unholy Trinity, how the unholy Trinity, um, Satan, our sinful flesh and the world that's in the world are all mm-hmm. fighting for our attention um, and getting our eyes off of Christ and his and our ears off of his word um and doing exactly what lady folly um earlier in the book of proverbs is trying to do getting the people who are walking along their way to take a different path right and most of the time it, it with the word lust you know we we typically think of lust with our eyes right or lust with our bellies um and certainly those those are um biblically um are spoken of biblically many times. Um, and so keeping our eyes on Christ um, and our ears on his word, and as well as, you know, hungering and thirsting for, for righteousness um, will, will certainly keep us, um, keep us from such temptations. And as Luther says, help us, dear father, um, from you know, keep us from these temptations and uh, grant us, grant us strength in the time of testing. One of the things that the world, Satan, and our sinful natures love to tempt us with and lust after is worldly wealth. 
That's why this whole section begins with a false balance that's dealing with money, and money comes in time and again because, as the scriptures say, you know, it's difficult, right, for a wealthy person to enter the kingdom of heaven. That difficulty comes from our natural reaction to want to rely on ourselves, to rely on our own wealth, our own strength, our own whatever. Um, but those things come to an end, whether it's our, you know, our strength or our wealth or you know, anything that we might consider good and valuable in this world, they come to an end. Verse 7 says, when the wicked dies, his hope will perish and the expectation of wealth perishes too. Now, I'd love to hear what you have to say about the expectation of wealth, or it could be translated strength. But to me, it's this expectation that I see oftentimes where everybody kind of thinks that no matter what they get sick with, that eh, there's, there's, a, there's a solution out there. No matter what problem comes their way, eh, as long as they can get up enough money, they'll be fine. Wealthy people, I think, <laughs> rely on that even more so. They just they feel like they're almost invincible because they can get the best everything to be able to achieve whatever desires they want. And yet there's a time when that won't mean a thing. At least that's that's what's hitting me from verse seven. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, I am. Well, because this is the problem, right? The wicked dies when, when the wicked dies, his hope will perish. That means that all he thinks about is materialistic time um, and, and goods, you know, so it's all about materialism. Um, there's the, the hedonistic carpe diem sees the day for tomorrow we die. Right. So everything um, that the wicked one does um is is bound here on earth and so there is no hope otherwise the only hope he has is to continue to live um and if he dies it's gone right there's nothing after for for the wicked or at least that's the expectation right and then with that next couplet there the expectation of wealth perishes too well if if he's not around to receive it right if he can't work or if he can't have investments come his way by interest or whatever, there's nothing there. So um, you, you're not going to grow anymore um, from the day of your death. And so that's why I think um, there is this strong um, desire uh, for people to gain as much money as they possibly can, just like the, um, the, the, the rich fool, right? Um, he stores up all of his money. He's trying to get himself to a point where he can relax and say to his soul, soul, now is your time to relax. And God says, you fool, right? Because I require your soul of you tonight. You fool. You've put your hope in things that do not last. The righteous is delivered from trouble. But the wicked walks into it instead. That's verse eight. Isn't so that good? back in back in verse six, the righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the treacherous are taken captive by their lust. The righteous here is delivered from trouble, but the wicked they just walk right into it. Um, is that a intentional walking into it? Is that a because of their foolishness they walk into it? What do you think? Oh, I would say uh, the answer is yes. Uh, right lutheran um, yes i know but <laughs> but this is the but i mean but it's delicious isn't it i mean the righteous yeah, is right. delivered from trouble because it doesn't this is this is what i this is how i read the first part right um in this world you're going to have trouble but take heart i've overcome the world mm -hmm. right and so it doesn't mean that the righteous will not have any trouble of course it's just that they're going to be delivered from the consequences of the trouble does that make sense? Oh yeah. Or they're absolutely. going to be delivered, or they're going to be delivered from um, the the outcome of trouble. And the wicked, yeah, and, I, and the wicked. I the also one. I I see this connecting to to just the 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 paths too, right? If you have this straight path, then you can kind of see trouble coming and maybe avoid it. But mm -hmm. the wicked, it's they they're walking this crooked path. They never know what's around the corner because of their choices. 
See, yeah. in each of these, I see very practical ideas, but then I also see, you know, uh, more, I guess, spiritual meanings to it. And, um, and, yeah. and yes, I think it's all of these things included, but, but, but this idea that the righteous is, is not delivered from trouble in the sense that we never face it, as you pointed out, but also the wicked are walking into trouble sometimes naively, but always as a result of the choices they've made and who's there with them, right? With, with them in trouble. Well, the interesting thing is this side of life, God's still with them. We're, we're talking about, you know, the reason why these things are being proclaimed is not just to mock the wicked or be prideful in our hopefully not being on the side of the wicked, but rather so that we can warn them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think you're, you're on, you're spot on um, with, with this too. I mean, you got to think of Job, right? The one that you see stumbling into the fire, pull him out. Right. Um, and um, the, the fact of the matter is, is like you said, the righteous are supposed to be walking on, on the, the good way. Right. Um and yet, when we, when we think about why a person is righteous, it doesn't mean um, that you and I are perfect, right? right? We're still going to, our sinful flesh is still going to lead us into temptation, right? And that's why we pray the Our Father, you know, lead us not into temptation. God's not the one who tempts us, but we, we find enough trouble for ourselves, Right, even though we are called God's children, and we are by the waters of holy baptism, but we continue to fight against our sinful flesh and the world and Satan himself, um, so that we um, are not brought into uh, where trouble befalls us everywhere. Um, the wicked. I, the, when I when I start looking at this further, I, I begin to wonder: um, Do the wicked here? see what they're walking into as trouble or right. do they see it or do they only understand trouble after the fact? Yeah. You know and I think I mean? that's, is yes, it, absolutely. Do they, do they walk in, Do they walk into it thinking, Oh, this is all good and great. Kind of like the, um, the feast of lady folly. Right. And that's what they I was going to connect know. to. They do, yeah. They do not know that they're walking into Sheol and that they are the ones who are actually being feasted upon by Sheol. Well, and I think I think to understand it that way reframes our relationship with the wicked, with the unbelievers. I mean, yesterday we talked about um, – I said that really we have to look at these people as people for whom Christ died, and therefore no, no person is really our enemy. And I got a little pushback, I think, and that's okay because of things like the precatory psalms or the reality of enemies of God and their actions being also then enemies against the church. And I don't deny any of that. But I think the individual human being is someone for whom Christ died. And, and the, the Proverbs have described them as, as fools, not as, not as um, vicious, vindictive, or dangerous, but just sort of fools who don't have knowledge, don't have wisdom, or have wisdom but don't exercise it. Um, yeah, I would, I would agree yeah. with what you're saying. I mean, because what are we to do, right? Um, my congregation and I were just, uh, we were, we celebrated a Thursday evening, evening prayer, and we got to read the parable of the sower a couple on um, last Thursday. And um, the, that was the daily prayer gospel. And anyways, the interesting thing there is, if we have the word and it's blessed us, should we not also then go and sow that seed as the Lord tells us to be doers, not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word, as James um, 1 verse 22 says, to be not only be hearers, but doers of the word. And what do we get to do with that word? We get to sow it into someone else. Um, and ultimately, Lord willing, we get to see that unbeliever transformed by the power of of the word into a fruitful christian i think there's another aspect too because so far maybe with the sole exception of the first verse 
we've been talking about kind of a vertical relationship, a vertical righteousness, like, you know, whether or not you're going to be saved, uh, I guess, in common language. You know, are you are you righteous or are you wicked? Starting with verse nine, it, it kind of shifts to horizontal righteousness. That is, how does our wickedness or the wicked person's or wicked man's wickedness, how does that affect our neighbor? Um, so verse nine says, with his mouth, the godless man would destroy his neighbor. But by knowledge, the righteous are delivered. Verse 10, when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. But when the wicked perish, (laughs) there are shouts of gladness. Now, it keeps on going in that theme. I'm going to pause there. But, you know, the, the, the wicked run their mouth. It doesn't just hurt their position before God, but it can destroy a neighbor. Yeah, exactly. Um, which and is rep- why- oh, sorry. And, and rep- sorry, just want to add- and reputation of the wicked person because the city's excited when they're dead. <laughs> That's not what right? you want. No, no. Um, but I mean, we have the same. Um, we we have to be we have to be careful of our own tongue, right? Even as Christians, right. um, going back into uh, the book of James for a quick moment, um, just to remember that the t- the, the tongue is perhaps the most vicious part of our body uh, when it goes um, and speaks slander or something against our neighbor. Um, and so we do need to be very, very careful um, with with our own mouths that what comes out of it. By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked, it is overthrown. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. All right, that's the end of verse 13, just adding a few more. So we see how it's affecting other people, right? So the when you're upright, not only does it affect you, but it affects your family, your neighbors, heck, the whole city. But the wicked's mouth can actually overthrow not only a neighbor, but a city. And so, so you know, there's also then some practical ideas here. Like if you're going around belittling your neighbor, it doesn't make any sense. Why not build up your neighbor? But a man who understands remains silent. And I think that suggests that sometimes you might have belittling things to say, but it doesn't always or probably even ever really make sense to say them. Well, that's the that's the positive side of the Eighth Commandment, you know. Um, to say everything in the kindest way. You, if you have nothing good to say, say nothing at all, right? Um, and so on and so forth. Like these are, these are pretty um, self-explanatory proverbs in just common sense. If we, if we keep our mouth shut, right? There's not going to, if we want to get along, if we want to go along to get along, we keep our mouth shut, right? Um it is very interesting how, how, how practical these, these little proverbs of Solomon are. Um, and I have to wonder um, for, for Solomon here, if he's thinking about how many times he's kept his mouth shut as mm-hmm. king before people who are coming to him for, for, for judgments, right? And he knows that they don't have a case and they come before him with, with some outlandish claim, but a man of understanding remains silent and allows them to keep speaking. Right. Gives them their voice, even though they don't have any sense, it's, you know, and, and, you know, that too, that's such a struggle for, I think all people, but especially our teenage believers, because we'll teach them things like, well, you can't lie. You, don't, you should never uh, bear false testimony against your neighbor. Uh, but they get this idea that, well, so long as something is true, I can go say it. So long as I can somehow back it up or prove it, I can go around and tell anybody I want. Um, that's not a proper use of the Eighth Commandment. It's not just about being true, but about what benefits your neighbor. Exactly. Exactly. And I, and I think that comes in verse 13. He who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. Um, and I looked that up just real quick that the, the verb covered is kasa, which is a synonym to um, the, the verb of atonement, to atone, um, to cover. And um, the 
the way that I look at this is we've been talking about it with, with our horizontal um, relationship with our neighbor. It's the loving thing to do. It's the loving, you know, love covers a multitude of sins, right? And we, we do not wish to speak ill of our, of our neighbor um, because it's not the loving thing to do. Christ did not speak ill of, of those men who were there in the crowd calling for his, for his death. But actually he speaks a word of forgiveness. He covers them with, with the very thing that they want. They want to be known for um, getting his blood. They want his blood covered, covering them, right? Um, in, a, in a sense that does not bring about forgiveness. They want to be known for, for calling for his blood. Um, but Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He does not speak a evil word against them, um, but actually loves them to the end. Being completely omniscient, imagine all the dirt Jesus could have said. I bet in just a few words, he could have shut every one of those men up just with their own scandalous behaviors. And yet, of course, as you said, he fulfills prophecy. And he also gives us an example Right. And so let's read the last few verses. Where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. Whoever puts up security for a stranger will surely suffer harm. But he who hates striking hands and pledge is secure. Okay, a couple of different disconnected ideas. That first one, though, it kind of reminds me of the phrase, uh, if you if you. uh, if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for anything. Or if you if you if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything, or something like that. Yeah. Basically, if if you don't have any guidance, any moral, any support, any authority, then then a people, I guess plural, a society, cannot function, cannot survive. And of course, there is only one source of truth, and that is God's. But even so, so many people who want to reject God and what happens to society, the people fall. Oh yeah, totally. And I think we're. I mean, to some extent, we're, we, we see this playing out with even just in our secular sphere, right? Um, and I don't believe that there really is a religious sphere and a secular sphere. So just bear me out. But sure. um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that when you can, there's a lot of people out there who um, wish to see the Constitution um, in one way or another. And if the Constitution, like you said, is not actually... Um, upheld, well, then there's no standard by which people um, should live as a society in the United States. Ergo, it's going to fall. The same can be said for the Christian church, right? With where's the, where's the guidance? It's the word. If the word is not around, if the word is not preached and proclaimed into the ears of its hearers, the same thing, the church falls, right? This is why we preach Christ crucified. That's why we confess that the fourth article of the Augsburg Confession is which uh, is upon which the church stands or falls, right? Um, if we preach Christ crucified for the sin of the world, for our salvation, um, this is why we spend so much time on that, right? Um, so that we do not fall. Um, and what do we have? We have we have the guidance of of the authors of Holy Scripture. We have their prophetic voice. We have the apostolic teaching um, to guide us in our faith. Um, So you can see this in two different ways. You can see it on the more practical level, the worldly level, I guess, and then, of course, the spiritual level for the church as well. Well, I think that's where we're going to end our program today. Let you go back and rest your voice and get feeling better. Thanks for joining us, even though you're under the weather. Uh, the well, Reverend I, Jacob I Herkamp, very much. <laughs> pastor of Christ Lutheran Church in Noblesville, Indiana. Yeah, it's it's always great to have you on the show. I look forward to having you back. Well, Christ be with you and uh, blessings as we uh, look forward to this upcoming Sunday. God's, God's grace and God's peace. Uh, also to you. Hey, tomorrow, folks, we're going to keep on going with Proverbs 11, 16 and following. And we'll be joined by the Reverend Dr. Matthew Richard. Now, that passage highlights the grace and strength of dignified individuals and the destructive nature of ruthless behavior. Uh, So, for instance, it begins, a gracious woman gets honor and violent men get riches. 
A man who is kind benefits himself, but a cruel man hurts himself, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to have a, a heavy emphasis on the value of generosity and teaching that those who seek the good of others will secure prosperity in life, whereas those driven by greed only harvest trouble. That and a lot more tomorrow as we finish up chapter 11. Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.